Hello, everyone, and welcome back. This is the final Q&A session of the day with our, our last two groups of speakers here. So uh, just remind everyone how this has been working throughout the day. Uh, if you have questions, you can uh, shoot them to me on Twitter. You can uh, send them in the chat. Uh, we've got all these different channels open. Uh, and so we've already collected a bunch of questions from folks, uh, but feel free to please keep the questions going. Um, I do want to apologize that if it's a super specific or super technical question that's only going to apply to um, a smaller group of people, we, we might end up skipping it because um, we want to try and make sure that uh, all the people watching are um, getting lots and lots out of this. So let's go ahead and uh, dive in. And so um, one of the first questions on governance is uh, for Kawe. So uh, does government regulation affect any of your mental models around governance? Yeah, this is a bit of a different subject because regulation is kind of uh, the companies in charge, the project, the legal entities in charge, while governance itself is more about the decentralized governance itself. It's more about the evolution of the protocol and how changes are being implemented. So definitely one thing shouldn't overlap the other. You shouldn't be doing any non-compliance and, you know, off the records updates to your protocol, especially regarding data uh, management and so on. Uh, but there, there are two different concepts. It's good to keep in mind the regulation to the upgrades and the flow of your organization. But governance by itself is more focused, the centralized governance itself is more focused on the evolution of the protocol. Awesome. Uh, the next question is for, for Greg and Wyatt. So it, it sounds like from your, your story, you're doing a lot of uh, code spelunking. You said a lot of the code is written back in 2014, which um, when I think more broadly about the blockchain space as a whole, that's probably not uncommon, especially as a lot of traditional web projects are being ported into the blockchain ecosystem. Uh, like a lot of developers are going through the same things of like migrating from legacy JavaScript up to TypeScript. Uh, what have you learned or what, what advice do you have for other people that are trying to take old code and, and bring it into the, the modern era? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would have to say that we made two really, uh, <laughs> call them valiant attempts at actually rewriting the existing stack. Depending on how, how old we're talking, I would almost say it's always better to do a rewrite. Um, and doing an attempt at the rewrite is such a way that you maintain your like forward compatibility or you know, backward compatibility um, for the, actual, the users consuming it um, and then doing the plumbing in the background and changing it out completely. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to do it. We found after like two, three attempts, and the main reason for that is just because, uh, depending on how old your library is, like Web3.js used the keyword arguments um, as a catch-all for options instead of actually like defining options clearly and doing like error checkings on that. Uh, so because of it, really, um, it just makes it like awful, like living hell. Uh, so rewrite from scratch <laughs> and like try to match the API um, and then like really think hard about like how to make it modular. Um, because yeah, it's it never it won't get better <laughs> if you use the existing code. Um, okay. If I can add something to that real quick. Would you yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that um, it definitely depends how old like your your code is going to be. Uh, because I think you can definitely get in a situation where you can bite off more than you can chew um, if you just try to rewrite everything from scratch. Um, and so that, that that is definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, is look at your you know your team, your resources. Look at what's really important to you. Do you actually need to rewrite it? Can you rewrite certain sections? Can it be like a modular upgrade? Um, yeah, try try to employ different strategies because just deciding that like okay, like we're going to deprecate the entire thing and start from ground zero. Um, well, then you also lose you know any like novel ideas that you might have like come up with in the existing code and stuff. You definitely want to carry any of like the innovations forward and stuff like that. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, we as engineers always want to rewrite and not always the best idea for, especially when we have lots of users. Um, one of the questions in the chat was uh, more for Kawe. Uh, I think this question comes from the perspective of like a lot of blockchain uh, newbies don't necessarily understand uh, what the power of governance is and like what, what governance is. So how would you explain blockchain governance uh, to a, a newbie, someone who'd never heard of that concept before? 
Well, let's just start with tokens. What are tokens nowadays, if not a share of the project? Is a accessible way of you investing in a company that's decentralized and you can go there and buy 24-7 and sell 24-7. It gives you that freedom. So plugging into that is governance. So it's basically a novel way of getting the community partic to participate in your project and the evolution of it. And if you compare the, the blockchain communities with any other one in the software development from AI to robotics to anything, uh, blockchain is way more engaged. It's all about the users, all about the marketing and users want to work for you for free <laughs> because they want to make the project succeed. They want to see you pump and so on. So governance is an accessible way of giving users that chance and that feeling that they are doing something that to, to protect their investment and to bring something new to the table. Okay. And uh, Kawe, I'll, I'll give you another question here, or two closely connected questions. So uh, one is that is, uh, how do you get your community ready for governance? Because one of the things in your presentation you said was, uh, make sure you get your community ready. Uh, how, how do people actually do that? Sure. So first of all, build up active uh, community, not only people that are doing price talk and talk about, oh, when pump, <laughs> right? Uh, they're actually going in there and talking, uh, actually questioning your development team and saying, oh, where's the delivery and so on. And that can be done in multiple ways, like Telegram, it's the usual way, but I particularly like way more Discord. And since we're talking about Discord, Discord also gives you some options to get your community engaged in governance in a very off-chain off way. Like you can do voting directly with uh, reactions from, from, from Discord, right? It's a good first step, zero step, right? Uh, zero implementation time, you can just plug it in and start actually getting that sense from the community uh, well, that they are helping and they are actually moving things forward with you. And then you can move on to all the, the other suggestions that I, I brought like uh, snapshot.org, or even implementing something on chain. Okay, and there's a the very closely related question, um, which I think is all about the question of like, can you actually get enough participation? It says, uh, what can be done in next gen governance models uh, to increase community participation such that decisions are representative of the sufficiently big community? Sure, so first of all, uh, decrease costs. This is very, a very big topic in this conversation uh, of on-chain governance. And we have some options. There are some good layer two technologies that are coming out there. Uh, and also above all UX. Uh, it's not that friendly for users to go into sign a transaction and send or go to Etherscan to direct interacting there. If you can do something that even your grandma would know how it works and it's just about clicking here and confirming there, then it's actually uh, can bring a way more adoption. So I think those are the two main topics. Uh, first of all, making it more democratic and less costly, and then making it more accessible. And thank you for the question. It's a very good one. Okay. Uh, and back to uh, Greg and Wyatt. Uh, the question came up, when is version four coming out? You, 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 you pitched it very well. It sounds very exciting. Modern, modern TypeScript, new APIs, better APIs, less fragile code. <laughs> I think developers want that. Wyatt? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> of course, it's uh, the, the, the journey has been interesting for sure. Um, we're, we're now getting new help. We uh, chain safe acquired uh, node factory. So now we have additional developers to put, add on to the effort. And so, I, I want to say soon, uh, TM, you know, <laughs> um, it, we're, we're hoping, um, what we're going to do is we're the RPC wrappers. So like the web three ETH packages is, is kind of like getting closer to its like finalization stage. Um, and so we're probably going to kick out like a beta release for that, um, pretty quickly. I would hope in the next like week or so, maybe two. Um, and then, uh, we're going to be working on the rewrite of the web three ETH contracts package as well as uh, we're going with a different strategy for wallets and stuff with the Web3 ETH accounts we read. So um, that one um, kind of has to come in tandem with the contracts and stuff. And so that one will be coming shortly. Um, uh, so, I mean, definitely 
I would I would hope for it in like in the next month or something like that, uh, relatively soon. Uh, and uh, someone sent me a joke that said uh, maybe they should have called it web 4 js awesome. uh, All right, back to Kawe. Um, let's say you have an on-chain governance model, but you want to move to a cross-chain governance model. Um, do you have any tips for making the, the migration? Well, at JigStack, we already started off with a, a more cross-chain governance approach, but uh, depends on what your current status is. Uh, you could wrap your token, for instance, to do something uh, with more freedom and moving across chains. And yeah, the regular tip, it, is, it stays the same. Uh, try to do things modular and avoid big migrations, right? If you can do things by step and bring something new uh, little by little, uh, it, it's, it's probably best and try to keep in mind that no one likes big migrations and having to, uh, you know, deposit tokens somewhere to mint new tokens and do all that stuff. So if you want to do a big migration, do it at once and with a lot of planning and, and thought put into it, or you can ju just put, uh, put out some more modular, um, uh, contracts out there that your users can interact little by little to, to try to get to this paradigm of cross-chain governance. Awesome. Um, and then a uh, question for the Web3 uh, team. Are there, are there any audacious features that are in your roadmap that you haven't started working on, like support for other chains or anything like that? Good question. That's why we're building a plugin system so that people can just throw it in. Uh, so once that kind of whole system gets worked out, I'd highly encourage everybody, you know, anybody that, you know, wants a specific chain, um, toss up an issue, we can put it in triage it, but can't guarantee that we'll get to it right away. But at least it'll be a really clean way of getting access to it. Um, and the nice thing with the plugin system is you'll be able to uh, basically inherit all the goodies that come with Web3.js uh, without worrying about mutating um, any other namespaces or polluting them. Because uh, we'll basically just be using uh, the node event emitter to effectively communicate things from the parent. So something changes like the network or whatever, um, you can just directly funnel that back down and you know you can handle it in your plugin however you want. Awesome. But that would be uh, the audacious thing. <laughs> Getting that. Okay. Is yeah, no, cool. that, anytime I see a plugin system that where developers care about actually enabling people to build plugins, that's, that's, it's very healthy and good to see. Uh, next question is back for Kawe. Um, can Chainlink oracles be integrated into governance protocols? 100%. Uh, this is what we were talking about, cross-chain governance using oracles. So this is a good way to unify the way that your token is interacting with data as a whole and bring it all down into one single governance module that's running somewhere, doesn't really matter where, but if you can get that sort of standardization on where the data is actually coming from and how the token is interacting with it and uh, what's the weight of it, then uh, you're good to also bring up a uh, a new, maybe novel uh, cross-chain governance system. Uh, currently, there are not many examples. People are usually uh, getting into more uh, embedding data into the token or giving the token some special functionalities that enable cross-chain. But I think this is uh, not a, a growing tre trend. I think that uh, with the great work that Chainlink is doing and uh, how Oracle systems are becoming more and more performatic and a lot of projects are subsidizing it as well. So uh, once costs go down and features go up uh, regarding Oracles, which is what's currently happening, we can start seeing way more uh, Oracles being involved in the cross-chain governance. Awesome. And uh, let me just try and sneak in one last question for you, Kawe. Um, you you mentioned in in your talk that uh, testing and monitoring are important. 
Um, but how do you guarantee or how do you ensure that testing and monitoring is happening with the decentralized governance? Uh, like I was mentioning, uh, monitoring is a bit of a guaranteeing that monitoring is happening, something that's more up to the team to do and ask for the community to help out as well and making it also public. And we're, we, you can almost be sure that there will be somewhere, somewhere in the world that is going to be looking at your code and how it's performing alongside you and your devs. But now, uh, Regarding the testing, it's not really, we're not talking about hard hat tests or truffle tests. It's actually on-chain tests that are running well, in the same block that you're actually redeploying or upgrading your contract. So it's a deterministic way of assuring that the test is happening. And for that, you can look at the USDC v2 upgrade post that I uh, linked in my presentation. And uh, it's a very good example of that. So it's deterministic. The tests are actually happening. You're asserting everything that needs to be asserted. So uh, you have a, an extra layer of security and safety from your side that the rollout is succeeded. Awesome. All right, well, I wanna thank all of our speakers here from this last block. Uh, these were fantastic talks. Thank you so much for the Q&A.